Well, welcome everybody. Um, just a quick note uh, as you're coming in, um, there are some challenges with the Zoom captioning today. So Karen just dropped a link uh, in the chat uh, for folks to be able to um, view the, the captioning. So uh, check out that, um, that link. Um, so today, uh, really thrilled to have a, a packed agenda uh, and to have our featured presentation uh, from John uh, Brogdon, who's joining us all the way from Australia at 4 a.m. Um, so we'll, we'll hear from John about Lifeline Australia and his work uh, with Lifeline International. So we'll get to that in, in just a few minutes. Just want to uh, highlight that we are continuing to grow our participation. Um, we had record viewership of the special youth edition uh, conversation uh, on uh, January 4th. Uh, really speaks to the, the volume of interest and eagerness uh, in SAMHSA's work in this space and really just the need that we're seeing in the communities around uh, youth mental health. So uh, if you haven't already, check out that recording. Uh, if you're having trouble uh, with the, the calendar appointment for the Crisis Jam, um, Karen's going to drop a, a link in the chat and you can download that fresh uh, Outlook series um, to make sure you don't miss uh, any of the, the Crisis Jam. So uh, be sure to do that. Uh, you can also visit talk.crisisnow.com uh, to sign up for the weekly reminders and the newsletter um, for this Crisis Jam learning community. Um, so I encourage you all to do that and, and tell your friends, tell your colleagues to do so as well. Uh, and you can access uh, recordings and PowerPoint slides from, um, I think we've had 100 crisis, crisis Jam conversations at this point. So lots of great resources um, on there. Next slide. So from our, our news updates this week, just want to hit on a couple of key articles that folks uh, may see, uh, may have seen in the news and make sure folks are aware, um, but continuing to see some press attention to uh, the issue of psychiatric boarding, um, particularly uh, this, this article focuses on some of the challenges um, that are happening in New Hampshire around um, psychiatric boarding, um, and I guess you know speaks to the the underlying importance of this 988 work that we're doing to to move upstream to prevent some of these challenges that we're we're seeing play out. Um, another article I want to call your attention to is that. Um, uh, the VA uh, announced that they're going to pay for all emergency mental health care starting next week. Um, I think this is probably uh, uh, not getting quite the attention it deserves, but uh, it seems to be a pretty pretty big deal in, in increasing access for, um, for uh, folks who receive their health care through the VA. Next slide. And then finally, want to draw attention to a, a piece in Mental Health Weekly from Harvey Rosenthal, who many in this community um, know, uh, that's focused around uh, the issue of, of coercion, uh, which I know is a, a, a complex, complex set of issues, um, but again, uh, an important and interesting perspective to, to take a look at um, as we pursue and, and advance the work of the building out the crisis system. So encourage you all to, to take a look at that article as well. Um, the quote for this week comes from Tanya Miles um, and again speaks to this, this notion um, of what we're building here together. And the quote is, from the curbside to the country club, a crisis makes us all equal. Um, and I think it's just a really powerful, powerful reminder um, uh, of the, the work that we're doing and, and how um, we are equal in, in, all of, uh, in all of it. Next slide, please. We shared these slides a, a couple of weeks ago, uh, the host for, from that call, um, but just wanted to remind everybody uh, that they're out there, um, that there are three digit crisis numbers uh, in, in multiple countries. Uh, the US isn't the only one. Um, so the UK was the first to do that with their 111 uh, number. We think we think the first, right? Um, and then uh, the US has obviously uh, uh, followed suit with developing the 988 crisis line, um, which is why we're all here today. Uh, and then also excited that uh, Canada is following suit as well. They they use 911 for uh, emergency services, and they're following suit to create a 988 for uh, crisis services as well. And then, of course, Australia, which we're excited to, to um, hear more about the work in Australia. Uh, they have a three-digit um, crisis line as well. So uh, excited to see this international uh, trend of making crisis services uh, more accessible to, to folks. 
And uh, so that brings us to, to our feature presentation uh, and conversation today with uh, John Brogdon, um, who is joining us, as I said, all the way from, from Australia. Um, John is the, the president of Lifeline International, um, and we're really excited to hear kind of uh, the history of, of the Lifeline Australia and now Lifeline International. Um, so, John, I'm pleased to turn it over to you. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning from Sydney, Australia. And um, like in so many things, Lindsay, it's a day ahead in Australia than it is in America. I'm not. I'm not wanting to make anything big out about that. But not only 4 a.m. It's it's Thursday here, so um, I'm really flattered to be involved uh, with you today. Um, I'm here in part because I can't say no to David Covington, your friend David Covington, and. Um, I do also want to acknowledge my great friend Sue Murray, who's on the, the session as well from um, Australia, who ran Suicide Prevention Australia for many, many years and got it to a great position and now continues to work in suicide prevention globally um, with zero towards zero suicide. So um, first of all, I want to start by acknowledging those of us uh, here today who have lived experience of mental illness, although I, I want to, Lindsay, leave everybody with one request, and that is that we start talking about living experience, not lived experience. I have living experience. I have, su I have suicidal ideation. I have depression. Um, I'm medicated for those. I'm treated for those. I may well be for the rest of my life. So my experience isn't lived in the past. It's living um, in the past in the present and probably into the future. So I think it's important because often the language, we all know how important language is. So when, we, when we use the language living, uh, lived, I think it suggests it's happened in the past rather than that it continues with us um, as it does with me. Um, as I said before, I, I, I live with uh, suicidal ideation and with depression. Um, about 18 years ago now, uh, I was pursuing what was a reasonably successful career in politics here in the state of New South Wales, which is the largest state in Australia, on my way to be what we call a premier, what Americans would call the governor, um, at a quite young age. Um, I'm from the right side of politics, but in Australia, you'll be stunned to hear voting is compulsory by law. What that does is changes the political landscape. So you'd probably put me right in the middle of American politics, to be honest. Um, I was on track possibly to become the Premier, the Governor of New South Wales. I said and did some stupid things in public uh, that led to the end of my career as the leader of my party, but that led to a suicide attempt, a very public suicide attempt that finally ended my career in politics. It was a very difficult time for obvious reasons, but the great revelation, and whilst this is only 18 years ago, in the world of um, uh, Australians, and I think uh, most people around the world, beginning to accept suicide more and talk about it more, to normalising mental illness. 18 years ago probably feels like a 1,000 years ago, but what overwhelmed me at the time is that my wife Lucy and I received um, emails, letters, gifts, cards, faxes, for those who you remember, remember what a fax is, from about 10,000 people around Australia, a country of uh, 23, 4 million back then. And um, these were cards and messages from people with a very simple message. And uh, it was, uh, I'll Americanise this uh, phrase, and it was one letter, one letter I received from one man up in the Northern Territory of Australia, which is the Alaska of Australia, if you like, except the, the other extreme in temperature, very hot, very tropical. And this man said in his one sentence letter to me, um, uh, don't worry, we all make mistakes. That's why pencils have erasers on the other end, full stop. That was his entire message to me. And that was the message that I received 18 years ago from the, the people of Australia, that we all make mistakes. And for me, it was a turning point without wishing to over, overstate it. And Sue might speak to this later. I think it was a bit of a turning point in Australia for people realising that suicide isn't the end for many people. Attempting suicide and surviving it can be a very new beginning, which it's been for me. So I left politics uh, I, and I went into um, business. But I particularly, um, in my spare time, in my volunteer time, I went into suicide prevention for Lifeline. I'll come to Lifeline in just a minute. The, the, uh, 
as best as I can understand it, with a lot of help from professionals over many years, my suicidality, my depression results from difficult times as a child, um, alcoholism in our household when I was a kid, uh, abuse, physical abuse um, against my mother, um, and a lot of difficult times for us kids watching that and being around that. And um, I remember digging that down very deep inside me and not dealing with it, and it eventually exploded um, in terms of a suicide attempt and a diagnosis of suicidal ideation and depression. For me, um, when I turned 50 a couple of years ago, I, I, I told myself it wasn't a big milestone birthday or a big zero birthday, but it was in the sense of reflection. And for the first time in my life, I reflected back to, to the suicidal ideation with which I live. And I realised that I'd had it really uh, from under the age of 10 when there was yelling and screaming and fighting and, and all of that happening in our house. I would say to myself back then, if this gets too much, I will kill myself. I remember that quite distinctly. And it was a real shock to me because, you know, you we, we all work in this world and we all hear about, you know, kids under 10 taking their own lives. And we're all stunned and shocked and hollowed out to the core by the fact that that could actually happen. But I hadn't realised myself that it was an option in my mind. So here at 53, I, I spend a lot of time working Obviously, I'm medicated. I see um, my psychiatrist regularly. I try and live a life that um, ensures my own mental wellness as much as possible. I'm not perfect, but I do get better as I get older. I have the love and support and caring of my wife. And I've never hidden, I've never hidden what I live with. And I've been very open about it because I think people who have profiles, people who have experiences that they can share, if they share them, we do begin to make a difference in the way people live and in the way people reach out for help. And I'll reflect that in just a minute in terms of the story of Lifeline during COVID. So Lifeline Australia was started almost 60 years ago, literally the 16th of March, 1963. It was, uh, its idea came about about 18 months earlier when um, uh, a then Methodist church minister in Sydney, Australia, on a Sunday night, received a telephone call at his home. And the man who rang him said, my name is Roy. You don't know who I am, but I'm going to kill myself and I want to tell you why. And he talked it through with this man. And two days later, uh, this minister of religion, uh, the Reverend Alan Walker, got a phone call from the police uh, from a pretty seedy part of Sydney called King's Cross. And the police officer said, uh, are you Alan Walker? And Alan Walker said, yes, I am. And the police officer said, there's a dead body here, a man's dead body here with a letter pinned to his chest for you. And that letter explained this man's predicament, explained again why he took his own life. And at that moment, back in 1961, Alan Walker said, we need to do something. Uh, we need to have a lifeline, a lifeline for people who find themselves in that deep, deeper, deepest and darkest point of their life, a, a point I found myself in, deepest and darkest point in their life where they think um, the only thing to do is to take their own life. Now, I'll tell you what's so significant about this is he was a minister of religion. Most, if not all, religions regarded suicide as a sin back in those days. And in most jurisdictions in Australia, suicide was a crime. But this man said, we need to have, back in 1960, the early 60s, we need to have a lifeline for people in this dark point in their life. So it took some time to get it together from 61 through to early 63 and started. And we celebrate 60 years of service in uh, a matter of weeks. Uh, lifeline is a household name in Australia. When people think of suicide, when they think of emotional mental health crisis, they think of Lifeline. If there's ever, ever a story in the media about suicide, it will, at the bottom of that article, almost certainly mention Lifeline and our number, 131114. Um, it operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week nationally. It operates on a rotational system. We have 41 centres around Australia. Australia is a very large country with a very small population because we're so arid in the middle. And it's a country of some 26 million and growing people at the moment. 
We operate this service um, and it is an extraordinary service that over the years has been volunteered staffed. But uh, in the last 10 years, we've had to move to a mix of about two third volunteer, one third professional paid staff, sorry, paid staff, because we simply couldn't staff the hours between midnight, six in the morning. And, and when you and I are sitting down having a, a lunch with family or friends on a Sunday afternoon, that's the time we used to find it hard to get volunteers. So we now pay to have people fill our difficult time so we can maintain that service. Um, so uh, before COVID, Lifeline Australia received on average 2,400 contacts a day. Back then it was uh, calls, it was chat, and it was a small number of texts. We weren't operating 24 seven on text. Today, three years later, oh, so I, should, I should make an Australian point here. We also had horrific bushfires, you might recall, or wildfires just before COVID took off. So let me take you back to before the wildfires and before COVID. And we're in heavy drought, we come out of a heavy drought. So we're coming out of a heavy drought. So um, 2,400 on average a day. Today, making one point, which is during COVID, we went to 24 seven text service. We now average 3,800 contacts a day. So we've gone from 2,400 to 3,800. I was the chairman of Lifeline Australia for 10 years, wrapping up about 15 months ago. In my early days in Lifeline Australia, when we had a, a spike in our calls, I would worry, I'd almost panic saying, what's going wrong in Australia? What's going wrong? with our brothers and sisters in the community that we're seeing an increase in calls. Now, many years later, I'm convinced that an increase in calls is a good thing because for 60 years, we've been shouting from the rooftops, please call Lifeline if you're in crisis, please call Lifeline if you're suicidal. There's no shame in mental illness. It's anonymous, we don't judge you, and please don't suffer in silence. And guess what? That's what people are doing. And we had uh, a number of remarkable hard statistics and anecdotal evidence during COVID that backed that up. We had men in particular calling us saying this, not only is this the first time I've ever called Lifeline, never ever did I think I'd have to call Lifeline. Now, I see that as a victory. I see that as a good thing because that means people are reaching out and getting help when they need it rather than suffering in silence. We also had a remarkable statistical shift during COVID, which was a 5% reduction in suicides in Australia during the two years of COVID. 6% in my state, the largest state in Australia. Why? Well, it's because I think this message of people reaching out and getting help was legitimised by government, by the media, by the woman and man on the street, that now's not the time to tough it out. A very strong message we pushed is during COVID, it's okay not to be okay. These may be phrases that you were using across the US at the same time, but I, I, during my, my media appearances, which were enormous, not about me, but about Lifeline during COVID, quite extraordinarily high, the media played a very positive role in saying, you know, use Lifeline, use other resources, reach out and get help. The government here in Australia allowed us, allowed, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, not, I'm not a business person these days, a recovering politician, David Covington, hoping for full recovery. Um, the, uh, the government allowed one on one sessions with uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, and counsellors to go online. Previously, they had to be face to face. That was a game changer. Um, there are a whole lot of other things that surround why we saw a suicide reduction. But um, it was a magic moment. There are many theses to be written about why this happened in Australia. And I know it happened in other major advanced cities in the world. Didn't happen everywhere in the world. Um, we still, of course, we're all here. I imagine we're all here today to fight the cause to reduce suicide. And like uh, Zero Suicide, uh, the movement internationally, Lifeline Australia set ourselves the objective of an Australia free of suicide. Um, and for those who think that can't be done, we're never going to know whether it can or can't be done until we try, until we work hard and hard and harder to make sure we work out whether we can do it and we save as many lives along the way. So we have, um, we're funded by federal government, by state government, we're funded by uh, philanthropy, very big, big, medium and small. We run, and I, I've never quite worked out what the, um, 
equivalent of this is. It's a very old-fashioned phrase in Australia called opportunity shops or op shops. These are shops where recycled clothes and furniture are sold often on the high street in suburbs around Australia and towns around Australia um, by Lifeline, which are fundraisers, book fairs. Um, this is people literally giving us their old books and we sell them and it's quite profitable. Even in 2022 and 2023, people want to buy books. Um, golf days, you know, everything from the smallest donation you can imagine right up to, you know, uh, enormous donations from government. Uh, Lindsay, why don't I finish off talking now about Lifeline International? So Lifeline International was started in 1966, once again by this man, Alan Walker. Uh, I should make the point that um, we are no longer a religious organisation uh, in the sense that we, we are um, neutral uh, in terms of how we counsel people with respect to their, uh, in terms of respect of discrimination or religiosity. So we're, we're, a, we're a, non, a non-partisan, non uh, non-judgmental organisation these days with a very proud heritage started out of um, the Methodist Church in Australia. I'm a Catholic, so it's it's no longer a religious thing. Um, Lifeline International started by the same man in 1966, and this was um, to establish a network of Lifeline centres, particularly in the Pacific. Um, over the coming up to 60 years of Lifeline International, we've grown away from um, a network and in the sense of ownership, and our members are standalone members around the world. As of Tuesday, we now have uh, 24 members uh, around the world. Um, in the United States, uh, we have two members. We have uh, uh, the International Council for Helplines, uh, Justin Chase. Some of you may know Justin. Justin's on our board as well. And just on Tuesday, we uh, accepted membership from Impact. Suicide Prevention Centre out of Arizona. So we have two members in the States, two members in Canada. We also picked up Ghana, um, and I'll talk about Ghana as a great example in, in the moment, uh, and the moment, in the moment, in a moment, and we picked up uh, um, a suicide prevention line based out of Buenos Aires in Argentina. Our reason for being is twofold. How do we help our members who range uh, in services and resources enormously. How do we help them improve their resources? How do we increase our membership to create a network that shares knowledge, shares information, shares practice models, shares um, possibly even finances, training, all of those things and shares experiences, not unlike, of course, what you're doing today, but does it very much based on call centre or crisis centre, suicide um, call centre um, uh, basis. Not our, um, some of our members do more than that, um, but that's the core around our membership. Um, I want to give you a demonstration of part of the challenge. So we have Lifeline Australia. I just refer that, that to you in terms of the number of calls we do a day, the sophistication of our organisation, well-funded, well-volunteered, et cetera. Lifeline Papua New Guinea, um, Australia's nearest neighbour at, at, the, at the most southern point of Papua New Guinea and the most northern point of Australia is four kilometres away. It's very, very close up north. Papua New Guinea has one centre, three staff, 10 volunteers, no guaranteed electricity supply, no government funding, and suicide remains a crime. Attempted suicide remains a crime in Papua New Guinea, a country of over 15 million people. Um, so that's the, the breadth of our membership. Um, the other thing uh, that I think you'll find fascinating is Lifeline International will launch later this year a global movement to decriminalise suicide. Um, suicide remains, attempted suicide remains a crime in around 40 countries. Why do I say around 40 countries? There is, it appears to be, to the best of our knowledge, we're doing the work now, no solid data, no solid research that indicates exactly which countries have suicide as a crime. So we're doing the work. There are some countries where suicide, attempted suicide is a crime, where that law isn't enforced. There are other countries where it is enforced. Um, a consequence of it being a crime is the statistics are quite poor. If it's a crime, we don't an attempted crime, we don't actually really have strong numbers on it. Um, but I want to talk about Ghana. So Ghana is a country of 20 million or so people and, in Western and Africa. John, sorry to jump in, but we're, we're going to have to transition soon. So I'll let you sure. hit this hit this uh, I'll, anecdote. I'll, I'll and bring we'll it home. So, so sorry. <laughs> so we want to we want to work with you. We want to keep you informed about our campaign. We'll start. Now, there are many who have done the work, there are many who are working towards suicide decriminalisation, but we want to bring together with a global campaign. Um, we're working on all of that at the moment and we'll be launching it in September this year. Thank you. Thank you, John. And I really just appreciate your 
sharing your, your story, I, I think continuing to break down the stigma by sharing all of our living experiences is, is really powerful. And just thank you for your, your leadership in Australia and internationally to, um, to lead this movement and, and make crisis services more accessible. So we're going to transition to a couple of reflections from um, Sue Murray, who's the managing director uh, at the Zero Suicide Institute uh, of Australasia, uh, and James Wright, who is the chief of crisis center operations at SAMHSA. Um, would just love the two of you to, to briefly reflect uh, on um, the work that John shared uh, and, and kind of the um, the impact it had on you. So, so I'll turn to Sue first and then to James. Great, thanks um, very much, Lindsay. And uh, good morning. It's great to be with you um, once again on the Crisis Jam. Um, look, I think one of the things that really struck me is just how important it is to hear those personal stories. John opened with his own experiences of um, depression and suicidal behavior. And it's really only a very recent um, uh, addition to the, the tools that are being used by all of us who are working in suicide prevention. And I, I came in the, into this field from the area of breast cancer. And one of the things that struck me in that area was how much of a difference women who have been through the experience of, of breast cancer actually made to the system and the way the system was receiving and managing and treating women and engaging with women um, as part of their, their treatment team. And so coming into suicide prevention with that experience really um, gave me, I think, a lot of impetus to try and build up that, um, that profile of people with lived and living experience to share that um, and to open those conversations. Um, so that was one thing that I think is critically important. And, and we see certainly in Australia and, and globally now that many, many um, areas are uh, or events open with the discussion of that personal experience. And I think that's really been a, of great benefit to open the hearts and the minds of um, the wider community. And I think the, the other thing that is important that John's just only really just touched on there is where the, the global movement to decriminalize suicide. When we look at suicide, particularly in lower and middle income countries, that is where suicide is still considered a crime. And so being open, uh, being able to speak openly and to actively um, work with people who have presented with suicidal behavior, it's a real challenge. And I think that's a great campaign that Lifeline International is um, taking up the, the banner for. So there were my um, couple of reflections um, on John's presentation today. James, what would you add to that? Yeah, thank you, Sue. And, and especially thank you, uh, John, for your uh, your points there. And uh, I, I was listening uh, and I, I heard areas of possibilities um, as we were uh, going through. and. And John, you're talking about your living experience, and I, I love the uh, love the term. Um, uh, one of the things that we're working on here is how we um, look at uh, workforce and opportunities to help support as we're growing 988 internal uh, to the United States, and how we've worked um, in partnership with both the uh, 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 NHS and 111 and Canada as well uh, on their uh, three digit services, where we can kind of come together. And one of the things that um, strikes me is that a lot of individuals come into crisis services because of lived or living experience. Um, and how can we take that and harness it to really build a career path uh, to helping support individuals identify how to come in, how to help um, serve, uh, and how to help support. And so I do think there are tremendous opportunities um, even further upstream on how we can build that out 
um, as these services are being um, designed and uh, implemented. And then secondly, uh, one, one thought uh, came back is um, not only how do we build that, but how do we share um, connections and um, uh, opportunities uh, or outcomes across our, um, from our international partners. A great example, we were lucky enough to go over, uh, go up um, a couple months ago and uh, provide a review in Canada for the 988 team. Uh, and in visiting one of the crisis centers there, I learned of a different model that I had not heard of about engagement between uh, EMS provider and the um, hotline. Uh, it was a tremendous example of how we um, can uh, engage to ensure um, uh, meeting an individual's needs in the least restrictive, restrictive environment possible. Uh, and there has to be more examples like that. So again, when I turn to opportunities, I turn of how can we build a foundation to help um, share and support each other uh, as we build these out. So just again, thank you, Sue, and thank you, uh, John, for um, uh, speaking today. And James, I couldn't agree more. I think having that international lens and sharing lessons learned is uh, is really impactful and important. Um, David read my mind. I was going to ask a really quick question to Sue and John, which I know they could spend an hour explaining to us, but um, I would just ask if you guys could maybe take 30 seconds or 60 seconds. Um, we had a couple of questions in the chat about um, the role of law enforcement in Australia in your all's crisis services. Um, so just wondering if you could briefly speak to, to that. Does law enforcement have a role? How does that interaction work with Lifeline, et cetera? So while Lifeline Australia is available on 13, 11, 14, we do encourage people to ring. Uh, our 911 is triple O, zero, 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 triple O, um, to call triple O if, if the life is in danger. So... Um, they will coordinate um, and send police and ambulance to that uh, where required to that destination. Um, and if there's a firearm involved, they'll literally kick the door down and into the premises. We're very interventionist. Lifeline Australia is an interventionist service. So if you're ringing Lifeline and we make the assessment that you are at a very high risk of suicide or you'll tell us you've commenced the act of suicide, we don't seek your permission. We will... Uh, we can transfer we can um, transfer your details to the triple O service immediately. Keep you on the line, keep talking to you, and have police and ambulance attend where you are. Super helpful, Sue. Anything you'd add? I I think just the other area around crisis services. Um, that's really only or mobile crisis service, I should say. That's really only starting to gain traction again in Australia now. Um, we've learned a lot from the US actually about the mobile crisis service um, and the it's something that we had in Australia sort of 30 years ago it disappeared and now it's coming back again but still only in pockets so we've still we've still got quite a way to go before we actually have services that don't automatically direct people straight to emergency departments. There's still a long way to go. We also have uh, um, kiosks if, for the one a standing permanent phone uh, device. I don't know, it stands a couple of feet high. You press the button at a, at a couple of very high profile suicide spots and you can go straight through to Lifeline. So it's not mobile, but it's positioned at at a couple of very high profile, um, well-known suicide spots in Australia. That's really helpful. And I think interesting to, to hear about the kind of bi-directional opportunities for, for learning around mobile crisis and the work you guys have done on Lifeline and the mobile kiosks or, or the kiosks. So um, really a lots of opportunity, I think, for, for ongoing conversation and learning. So John, Sue, thank you both for getting up uh, early to, to join us and share with us um, and look forward to future, future conversations. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move us into to the next segment, uh, and we're going to transition to the trivia hot seat. Again, a reminder that folks can go to the SAMHSA store uh, to continue to access uh, materials um, and that the T-shirts are available for folks willing to uh, get in the hot seat or, or for purchase uh, from the uh, Crisis Talk uh, website. So let's move us into the, the trivia question of the day. And Jamie, Michael, thank you so much for being willing to, to be in the hot seat and uh, welcome. Thank you. I'm excited to win my t-shirt. 
<laughs> so uh, here's here's our question today. It's about the Holman Prize. Uh, in 2017, Lighthouse for the Blind and Visually Impaired in San Francisco launched the Holman Prize, which provides up to $25,000 each year to legally blind individuals. Um, and we're going to actually uh, hear from uh, Brian, uh, um, who's the founder of the Holman Prize shortly. But uh, the prize is named after James Holman, a native of England, uh, a best-selling book um, described how he became a prolific what? Uh, and the options here are marathon runner, author, activist, and lecturer, traveler and explorer, guitar player, singer, and songwriter. So Jamie, uh, folks can help you out from the audience, uh, but any, any initial thoughts as they respond to the poll here? All of those sound like amazing careers that uh, any of us would be uh, excited to to be prolific in. But I'm definitely going to have to rely on the audience here and see what the the poll results are. All right, because mine would just be a guess. Ooh, we got a pretty even split for mm -hmm. you. <laughs> so most folks coming in at author, activist, and lecturer. The second one is traveler and explorer, and then marathon runner coming in behind that. I think just for fun, I'm going to say C. All right, let's see what the answer is. Oh, you Wendy. are correct. <laughs> Winner. <laughs> <laughs> nice job. Yes. So he was a traveler and explorer and I believe wrote, a, a, yeah, he has the, the best selling book. So folks can uh, certainly check that out um, and encourage you all to, to do so. So Jamie, thank you so much. And you'll be getting your, getting your shirt. Thank you. And while we're on the topic of, uh, um, uh, this topic, I want to turn to Brian. So we, we've changed our order of segments a little bit and wanted to invite Brian Bashan um, to share during our lived lens segment. Um, as, as I mentioned, Brian um, is the founder of the Holman Prize and his work uh, with the, the Lighthouse for the Blind and Visually Impaired. So Brian, the question I want to ask you is, is what we always ask in our lived lens segment here, which is how will we know when we've arrived um, in the promise of 988 and, and crisis care in the United States? Um, that's a good one. I'd say uh, when blind people, as that's what I'm going to talk about just now, um, get the full engagement, respect, and, um, and services as anybody else. That's that's uh, that it in a nutshell. And thank you for rem remembering the Holman Prize. Uh, applications are coming up now for the next year, 2023. I want to give a special shout out to Lisa St. George, who connected me with this important conversation and learned a lot already. And something has happened to my speaking notes. Just a moment. No problem. Yeah. yeah, we really appreciate your willingness to join. I think, okay. you know, on, on this conversation, we've, we've heard a lot um, about how to make 988 accessible to um, individuals who are hard of hearing and, and really interested in your insights on yeah. um, making it accessible to individuals who are visually impaired as well. Yes, absolutely. And this intersectionality is so important. Just a bit about me. I'm fully blind now, but I've been a person who was a fully sighted child and a low vision adult and now fully blind. I've been a journalist, I've been a federal employee, worked in the Department of Education, CEO of Lighthouse for the Blind for the last 13 years. And then last year, President Biden appointed me to be one of four private citizens on the US Ability One Commission. That works with 400 nonprofits with $4 billion of federal contracts and employs 40,000 people with disabilities uh, as a first step in employment. So I'm here just as a blind guy, and I've known thousands of blind people in my time in this field. And guess what? Uh, blind people have crises like anybody else. But there are some special disability uh, considerations, as you just mentioned. If you, if you, I'm going to give you a few pointers. So if you encounter a blind person on the phone or in person, here are some things that will help the situation. 
first and foremost, it's, imp it's, it's fine to use the word blind or low vision. Don't wrap yourself up in linguistic knots and think of visually challenged, visually impaired, visually this or that. Blind, low vision, it's simple, it's what we are, it's our chosen term. And when you enter a room, if you're providing direct services, say your name, that's supremely important. Never talk to somebody's spouse or friend who's in the room with you. Uh, we call that the what is he like in his coffee situation, where you're standing there and they fix eyes on somebody else. Just talk to the person who is blind, visually impaired directly. Never, this is quite important, never touch a blind person without first uh, having a conversation about that. Um, it can be startling when people through um, best intent want to help or guide or anything else. But in this community, that is, that is such a trespass and often non-consensual trespass that one, a friend of mine coined the term help rape to describe grabbing, pulling, guiding, propelling a blind person. And if, if there is some um, travel that's involved, ask how you can help. Some blind people prefer an arm offer. Some people will follow behind you. Some people have a cane or a dog. It's all about that conversation. Another thing is there's no need to talk extra loud. We're blind and not deaf. We don't need that special othering kind of loud voice. And then an important thing to consider is though the blindness is very visible, it may not be the first, second, third, or even fourth most important problem in the crisis situation. So disability needs to be accommodated, but don't just assume that blindness, if it's present, is the biggest reason why you're having that interaction. Uh, I want folks in this field to understand that today, many blind people like I am right now use computers, use a smartphone, you text, they have Braille you with a smartphone or a voice note. So never hand folks papers without an accessible environment, uh, accessible alternative. It, this is not just a good idea in the United States, it, it's the law. Accessibility is a big thing. Uh, I considered saying this with kindness about the video at the top of this hour. It was maybe a nice video, but it was completely inaccessible. I have no idea what was on it. It wasn't video described. So that's another thing that would be a huge step. Make sure your materials are accessible to all people who are going to use them. If, if an individual can't read those documents does it, or can't use electronic uh, materials, designate a human reader in your office to read the materials. Be creative with transportation and make a plan. Often this is the big barrier for blind people. How are they gonna get across an office, a hospital, a campus, or to, to some treatment center? This is the barrier. There can be creative environments. Go, go, grandparent is one, Uber, others. So peer support has been a, available for blind people who are highly networked, many of us, for about 125 years. There are almost a thousand chapters of the National Federation of the Blind or the American, Found, uh, Federa American Council of the Blind across the United States connect the person with blindness to these things for local direct peer support. There are local private agencies who can also help. I, I might wanna just conclude here with, um, Blindness is not a tragedy, but actually correctly viewed, just one more state of being human. It's very common. There are 1.5 million Americans who are blind. That's as many Americans as there are dentists or lawyers, that common. 95% of blind people had sight at some point in their life. They know about faces and sunsets and architecture. What they don't have is accessibility bridges. And that's in some part, all of, our, all of our roles. So talk to blind people directly or talk to me, find me on LinkedIn 
or you can email me and we can put my email in the chat as well. And I just wanna thank you for taking a little time to get to know a, one more community in the great conversations that we're having. Brian, thank you for sharing that really practical advice and even helping us identify in, in this work here, um, some of the ways we can improve to make the, the crisis jam more accessible. And I think I even neglected to say my name at the outset of the conversation. So <laughs> I, I appreciate that. And, and I think reflecting that, you know, at the tables we're all at, where decisions are being made, where these systems are being designed, we really need to have partners with a variety of uh, lived experiences, disabilities, and, and backgrounds, um, co-designing and co-creating this work together. So, Brian, I really just appreciate you taking the taking the time to join us today and, and share. You got it. Thank you for the time. I'm going to shift us now to um, our crisis talk and turn to Stephanie Hepburn for the interview this week. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, I'll be very brief. Uh, I spoke with Dr. Jessica Wolf out of Yale, and she chatted with me about overcoming behavioral health workforce challenges. Um, it's a great piece because she knows the context. She's been working on this issue since the 70s and has followed and continued uh, working on it since then. So some of her points, bullet points, um, again, the article gives it a much more fleshed out um, bullet points and ideas from, from uh, Dr. Wolf, but she says what's really dire is inclusion. Um, she doesn't uh, like the word integration, um, and she talks about grass tops, grassroots, and when we talk about inclusion, she means peers specifically, um, and how the state really needs to support peer-run organizations and what they've done in Connecticut to do so. Thank you, Stephanie, and encourage everybody to, to check out that article. Um, John, I want to turn it over to you for the SAMHSA update. Uh, thanks, Lindsay. Uh, yes, very happy today to take a moment for the SAMHSA update to highlight the arrival of the new director of the 988 and Behavioral Health Crisis Coordinating Office, Monica Johnson. Uh, as many of you know, Monica was previously the director for the Division of Behavioral Health in Georgia and more recently the interim commissioner uh, for the Georgia Department of, of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities. Uh, we are beyond excited uh, that she accepted the position and will lead the 988 and Crisis Coordinating Office at SAMHSA moving forward. Uh, and I'm very happy at this point to pass it off to Monica to make a couple of remarks to the group. Thank you, John. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, this was a really rich meeting um, to our colleagues that came from across the way. I think it was 4 a.m. for them to the um, very important and needed message from Brian. Um, so, and then John, thank you for such a gracious intro. I am cognizant of time. We will have lots of opportunity to connect. What I will say is that I am elated <laughs> to be here. I am so excited about the future. I'm excited about the work and I can't wait to, to get going. So for those that, some of you are familiar to me. And so I do come from the great state of Georgia. I am very proud of the work that I've had an opportunity to be a part of in that state. Um, but I'm looking to now expand that knowledge and work with you all um, across this country and with our international partners as we continue to really get this system to where we need it to be. So I'm just excited. I'm ready. I'm eager. I'm trying to sit back. So people that know me know I am never quiet. But I am really trying to restrain myself and just listen and learn. So I'll be in that space for a little while, but I'm really eager to jump in and get started because we got a lot of work to do in a good way. So thank you. Thank you so much. And again, just excited. Awesome. Thank you, Monica. And a huge and hearty welcome from this entire group. I think I speak for everybody when I say we're looking forward to, to partnering with you uh, in this in this work. So I want to turn it to Nash Papid now for the update. So Arlene, uh, are you providing the Nash Pit update? Yes, I am. Awesome. Thank you, Lindsay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a new year. And so it's very likely that you have a new legislation legislative session ahead of you. Um, and for that reason, uh, we wanted to make sure that we reminded you about Nash Bid's 988 model bill template for 2023. 
Um, to date, about 30 states across the country have uh, enacted or tried to enact a 988 bill, and only about five has, have succeeded with uh, enacting a 988 fee, however. So this uh, template, whether it's your first, second, or third attempt, um, is here to help you. And um, we want to make sure that uh, you know how to use it. Um, the bill has some yellow highlights in it, which are helpful to identify any of the new language in the bill, things that were not there in 2022. And then anything that you see in track changes is not an error. It's actually changed to existing language from, from 2022 so that you can e easily identify it because some of that language might be in your uh, existing statute at this time. The things that are new for 2023 is that we've added some language on behavioral health parity. Um, we've talked a lot about that in the past, so I won't go into what it is, but there is language in there to assist you with that if you need it. Uh, we've also strengthened existing language from 2022 on health equity, which is a, an important issue and something that has been failing through uh, uh, COVID as we work our way through COVID. And uh, we also have some language in there to um, encourage coordination of, of a response with 988, 911, EMS, law enforcement, et cetera. And uh, that will help you try to uh, make that happen in your state. Uh, we've added language for financial stability to encourage everyone to apply for the Medicaid match of 95%, which is one big whopping size of a match. And that's something you don't want to miss. And then we have SAMHSA's new national guidelines for youth, young people, and families. Um, children um, are such an important part of this, and, and we're just beginning to really pay attention to them. So that would be an important component of a new bill. And then lastly, um, we are asking that Medicaid assist providers, MCOs, and others with billing and coding, because that will help everyone get the reimbursement they deserve for services. So you can look to our website. Again, it's called the uh, 2023 9-8 model bill template. And also wanted to remind you that our parity playbook, which is also new, is also on the website. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arlene. And we are getting tight on time, so I'm going to skip the federal updates today and move us right to the, to the state updates. So Jordan, can I turn to you? You certainly can. Um, I will run through these very quickly. Um, so we had a couple of bills introduced last week. Um, so in Maryland, SB3, um, that would appropriate $12 million to the state's uh, 988 trust fund. Um, we had a couple of hearings last week, one in Wyoming on HB65, um, which you might remember, um, also sets up a trust fund for um, $40 million. Um, that bill passed out of the Revenue Committee. Um, so hopefully um, should be getting a vote in the House in the coming weeks. Um, we also had a hearing yesterday in North Dakota, um, on SB 2149 in the Health and Human Services Committee. Um, there was no committee vote there yet, but we'll keep you updated. Um, and just two other things to flag um, in the larger continuum. So in Virginia, we had House Bill 2216 um, that just enhances insurance coverage for crisis response. And in Oregon, um, SB 695 that studies potential pathways um, for local governments um, to receive Medicaid reimbursement. Um, that is all I had. I will turn it back to you, Lindsay. Great. Thank you so much, Jordan. All right. I want to turn it over to Vic Armstrong now uh, for our race and equity and crisis care uh, segment. So, Vic. Thank you. Earlier this week, earlier this, earlier this week, we celebrate the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We marched, we sang, we prayed, and recited our favorite Dr. King quotes. And I would wager that there was not a moment on Monday of this week where someone somewhere was not quoting the doc, Dr. King's iconic, I have a dream speech. Think about the lofty aspirations that Dr. King spoke into existence, even in the face of oppression, even in the face of racism, even in the face of impossibility, he dared to dream, to dream of a better world, a more equitable world. What is your dream? What is your dream for our mental health system and specifically for those experiencing mental health emergencies. I have a dream. I have a dream that we will address the issues of access to care by supporting the creation of more mental health resources in communities of color and underserved zip codes. 
have a dream that we create more resources and communities where people live, work, play, and pray, rather than being content with a system that in essence says by the absence of resources in black and brown communities that my life does not matter or that it matters differently, that it matters less. I have a dream that we build a workforce that mirrors the populations they serve and that we partner with HBCUs and minority serving institutions to build that multicultural workforce. I have a dream that we commit resources to fund studies that consider the nuances of race, culture, and ethnicity and the impact of racism and structural exclusion on mental wellness. I have a dream that we wake from a self-imposed slumber and hear the voice of the marginalized recognizing that the lens of equity is about the intersectionality of race and culture and ethnicity, sexual orientation and gender identity, social economic status and physical disability in addition to living with mental health challenges. I have a dream that legislators, policymakers, funders and providers will recognize that there is no pathway to equity that does not include the voice of living experience. I have a dream that someone to call, someone to come and a safe place to go becomes a reality not for some, but for all. Together, we will build a better, more equitable system. And that is not a dream, that is strong talk. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, truly inspirational and a reminder of what we are striving for and, and, and the work, the importance of the work we're doing to create equitable access, so thank you. Uh, as we reach the top of the hour, just want to remind folks uh, to check out the latest episodes of Moving America's Soul on Suicide. Uh, episode seven is now available, uh, and episode eight will be coming shortly. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us uh, for this uh, hour uh, and remind you to join our upcoming conversations. Um, we will be hearing from Dr. Ursula Whiteside uh, next week on decreasing the gap between us and them. Uh, and then on February 1st, hearing from Megan Jones-Bell uh, at Google uh, around the work they've been doing. So uh, really thrilled to, to have you continue to join us. So thank you so much. Have a great rest of your Wednesday uh, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Take care.